Welcome everyone. Hello. It's so good to see you here on this cloudy autumnal afternoon. What a good time for us to gather together and talk about, hear, and discuss a very fascinating <clears throat> topic. I'm going to be using some of Abra's own words in my introduction. Since the very beginning of time, people have gazed upon the stars seeking meaning. Plants have nourished human bodies, hearts, and minds since before memory. Abra Arneson, a clinical herbalist for 30 years, weaves four major threads to create her book. Stories as old as time, plants, planets, and people. The stories advise us about how to live in harmony within the complex web of life. The vibrations of each planet is explored and how that vibration manifests or does not manifest in the activity of humans, the stories they tell and the plants they use for medicine. Abra's life as a woman close to nature, her practices in meditation and as a storyteller, her work as a herbalist, a doula, in hospice care, and as a teacher, has deepened her understanding of transformation from illness to health, from despair to hope, from disconnection to connection from fragmentation to wholeness, what could be more relevant to the times we are living in? I've, I've only just met Avra a, a couple of times. Once to when we organized today, another had the privilege, as maybe some of you did, of, of hearing her read at the uh, Wakefield Has Talent event at uh, Fairbairn Heritage Center. And my first impression, which I'm sure will bear out over the months uh, of continued interaction, is that here's a woman who is grounded in being, the lightness of being, ex exuding incredible warmth, strength, knowledge, and healing and a deep willingness to share and collaborate. Let's see what Abra has in store for us today, right here in the heart of the Wakefield Library. I picked out a few pieces to read. Um, this is this is one of my um, favorite little pieces from the book. And um, yeah, and it's, uh, it's a piece that I, is very mysterious to me. So I, I enjoy still contemplating it and reading it and thinking about it. So I hope, hope you do too. The essence of earth magic is the elements earth, water, fire, air. Ancient earth teachings from all over the world are based in understanding the magic contained in the elements. For it is the continuous play of the elements mingling this way, mixing that way, that create the abundance of life in all its miraculous forms. Understanding the change that never changes is the doorway to a brave, good heart. The oak tree is a magnificent expression of the elements. The earth element offers the oak sturdiness and finds itself in the hardness of the tree's wood. Oaks love water. 50% of an ancient oak's weight is water. They store water during drought, quenching the thirst of plants that grow around their roots. 
When there is abundance of rain, they release water back into the air to be carried on the wind and offered to dry places. It is their love of water that brings the oak's fire. It is a turbulent love affair between fire and water. Oak is left burnt and hollowed out by lightning's fire. It is in these empty places in the heart of the oak that shelter many small animals and birds. Finally, air, playing in the oak's green leaves, whispering of times past and times to come. In the circle, so this goes back, we're doing an Arthurian tale in this story, so this goes back to the Arthurian tales of um, Arthur and his, he journeys to um, Glastonbury, the great tour there, and he's journeyed under the earth and he's found the cauldron of Aran, which is the cauldron of plenty. And um, it's midnight black cauldron with um, pearls all embedded within it like the night sky. And it's held in the branches of a great oak. And around the cauldron dance the nine sisters. Anyways, Arthur gets in trouble here, but we're going to skip Arthur. We're going to talk about the nine sisters because I find them like really interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In the circle, I like Arthur too, but I really like the Nine Sisters. Okay, in the circle, the Nine Sisters spin round and round the ancient oak, chanting, intoning the wealth of earth, the many faces of water, fire's passion, hot and cold, and air's journey through time. The Nine Sisters carry the magic of earth's songs. They know the songs that heal and the songs that wound. The, er the sisters' wisdom songs told the beginning in endings and the endings in beginnings. The sisters' songs sow the seeds of seasons past into the seasons of future. Their songs fill the cauldron awan with plenty. They sing that every life is a flower, a river, the wind. The dance circling round and round the ancient tree was the dance of deathlessness, only changing form and changing form and changing form. The nine sisters sang songs of flowers becoming goddesses, trees forming fingers and words creating form. This is the teaching of Jupiter. Earth magic is the abundance of Jupiter. There, that's that. Could you tell us a little bit about how you evolved as a healer and as a weaver <laughs> and uh, an explorer through time? Oh. Um, well, you know, that's a long, long journey. <laughs> and um, yeah. Karen right there, she was there at the very beginning of the journey and she could tell you stories, let me tell you. <laughs> anyways, um, well, okay, so which, where should I start with that question again? Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about as a writer. You, you know, I've been a writer all my life, like there was never a time when I wasn't a writer. Uh, it's very something that I, ha I, I need to do. It's not something that I... Yeah, I need to write, and um, I love writing, even though it's very hard to do. And um, you know, as any writer knows, and there's many writers in this room, you know, you never know what you're writing until it's written, and it's at least that's my process. And and with the weaving, it was a a, a bit of a special experience because um, I started off. Um, uh, this book's extremely influenced by First Nations, in not so much in terms of their teaching, but in terms of my um, being with First Nations um, people and the generosity and um, kindness that was offered to me as a person um, with them. 
and um, and seeking that connection with ancestor that I watched that's very strong with um, my friends that I spent time with. They have very powerful connection to ancestor. Whereas me, you know, ha coming from uprooted people, I don't have that connection. I don't, I don't understand that connection. I don't understand that connection to land. So as a herbalist, it's all about connection to land, connection to place, connection to plants. And there's always this disconnect for me, you know, like working with the native plants here, you know, there's a, many are endangered and that relationship and, and uh, then the, the plants that have come here from somewhere else that were brought in the pockets of my ancestors and your ancestors those plants as well are here. So um, one of the things that, so I was looking for European roots that carried the plants because when our ancestors arrived, they arrived in a forest that they didn't know the names of any of the plants. It was a totally foreign place. They were, and so they planted their own plants, right? That's what they did. Why Why would they not, right? Like that's, they didn't know the names. They didn't know the medicine. They don't, didn't know the stories of what was here. So I wanted to go back and find some of that language and find some of that stories. And, and you know, I'm not satisfied with what I have found yet. Completely not at all satisfied. But um, it began. And it, in traditional European herbal myths and planets were used to describe, the vibration of plants was used to describe a plant's medicine. So I, I took that thread and that's how I came to this book. But as a writer, you know, it's been a long journey. And um, I remember I was living in Paris and I, you know, every writer has to go to Paris. And I was living in Paris and um, you know, I was so poor, <laughs> I had no money, and living on chocolate, and, you know, cafe latte, and and wine in green bottles. But anyway, so, um, and of course I was writing my heart out, and writing, and writing, and writing. And, and um, the, uh, I went to um, Shakespeare and Company on the West Bank, across from the sun, um, What's that big church that burned down? Notre Dame? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, across from Notre Dame. And uh, Walt Whitman's grandson was there, and he was very, like, you know, nourishing young writers and this. And this. so I showed him my writing, and he told me to get married. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm sure he's dead. <laughs> so as a writer, you have to, like, just keep going. You know, you got to just believe in yourself and do it. And, and because, you know, like, <laughs> Some expert's going to tell you you can't write, you know. Anyway, so just, yeah, so that's a funny story. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't you uh, pick another selection? Pick another section. Okay, so stories. So I went looking for old stories because I love stories. And I found this um, earth spirit, we'll call her. And she roams the hills of Scotland and Ireland. And I, I won't, I won't, I, I, I won't read the whole her whole story, but I'll, I'll read some of it. The Calais is everywhere, in everything. Every hundred years, the Calais must return to the sea to be renewed. This is the secret of her old, very old age. Legend tells us she must enter the water at dawn before the first, before the first dog barks or else she dies. Even the Calais has limits within her timelessness. This, this year was the year Calais needed to return to the sea. As she descended her mountain at dawn, for she left early to be sure to make it to the sea before the dog barked, she heard a great roar, a crack like something breaking and a terrible grinding sound. The noise frightened her. 
And she rushed down the hillside in her crooked old woman way to see what was the matter. As soon she came upon the ugly destruction of a clear-cut forest. Hidden in the crevice of a nearby cliff, she watched trucks haul the wealth of trees down a spiral carved into the mountainside. She could not believe her eyes and wanted to stop, but she had to make her way to the sea before it was too late. So the Calais walked on, and soon a strange thunder rumbled across the mountain. The air shook thick with dust, and under her feet, the earth shook. The Calais almost fell from the shock of it all. Again, she hurried down the mountainside in her crooked old woman way to see what was the matter. It was not long before she saw that the mountain had been cut away and again trucks hauling away the mountain's wealth rumbled down a new spiraling path carved into the mountainside. Again, the Calais wanted to stop but she had to make her way to the sea before it was too late. The Calais, confused, the weight of destruction on her heart walked on and on and came upon a hard, hot path running through a wide valley. Her feet burned as she walked on this strange new path. She looked to either side of the long, hard, hot path and where once wildflowers danced, bees buzzed, and her beloved deer grazed, there was now a plant with yellow flowers. For miles and miles, the same yellow flower, canola, bloomed. The land had become yellow the scent of the flower made her head feel heavy and her muscles ache. The Calais slowed, for she could not breathe the air with gentleness, but had to force it into her lungs. Step by step, she passed through this strange yellow valley, devoid of wildflowers, bees, and deer. Around a curve she walked and soon saw something lying on the path. She bent to take a closer look. It was a little fox. Its back was broken and one leg flattened. She knelt and tenderly touched the little fox, wishing to ease its pain. Tears crept from her eyes. And where they fell, a little pile of rocks formed to mark the tiny creatures passing. It was getting late, and the Calais still had a way to go. All night long she walked through a vast city with swirling lights, choking fumes, and cracked gray paths where people slept in rags while others scurried by with empty eyes. When Venus appeared on the horizon and out and announcing the imminence of dawn's arrival, the Calais smelled the sea. She paused on the cliff overlooking the beach where she had entered the water every hundred years and saw the sand was no longer golden brown. It was colored with bits of red and green, purple and orange. As far as her eye could see, the beach was littered with lengths of yellow rope and blue toothbrushes and black rubbered soles of shoes scattered among white tamp tampon tubes. Everywhere, clear water bottles were filled with sand. A headless Barbie doll in a bright red pail lay in a tangled clump of dried seaweed. At her feet, a tiny crab scampered by wearing a pink bottle cap as her home. The Calais paused bewildered and a dog barked. You gotta read the story, get the book to find out what happens at the end. 
And because Calais is magical and imaginal, you can imagine the ending. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I found that a spellbinding reading. Thank you so much for joining us on this afternoon. Um, there are books available if any of you would like to purchase one. And um, I thank you all for coming. It's beautiful to be a part of a gathering and listen with, you know, open hearts and open minds. And shall we go forth? <laughs> and take care of the plants around us and learn from them. Thank you so much, Avra. Oh, yeah.